from one of his patients. Other doctors, especially surgeons, are often at risk. I've had uh, knives uh, fall off the operative field, stick in my foot. When it comes to AIDS, how far should doctors be expected to go in putting their lives on the line? Good evening, I'm Britt Hume, and this is Nightline. The medication is helping. The debate over treating AIDS patients. I began turning down patients like that about a year and a half ago. Physicians have an ethical obligation to provide services for those who need their care. We'll hear from physicians on both sides of the issue tonight. This is ABC News Nightline. Substituting for Ted Koppel and reporting from Washington, Britt Hume. Every doctor takes an oath which says, in part, I will prescribe a regimen for the good of my patients according to my ability and judgment and never do harm to anyone. It doesn't say a doctor must treat a patient if he or she doesn't want to. But the tradition of treating the sick and injured without fear or favor is an old and honored one in the medical profession. Doctors through history have risked exposure to, and in some cases, death from cholera, yellow fever, polio. But it has been a long time since the last such infectious outbreak, and the AIDS epidemic has prompted some physicians to wonder if the risk of treating those for whom there is no cure is worth it. And as we hear in this report from Nightline correspondent James Walker, there is another question, whether doctors or other healthcare professionals can even know when they are running a deadly risk. Surgery can be a matter of life or death, obviously for the patient, now for the doctor too. The difference is AIDS. Dr. Hasib Aoun learned last year he has the fatal disease. He had his blood tested after he suddenly lost weight, became fatigued and feverish. Oh, what happened was my test came positive. We were shocked and repeated it, and he came back positive again. So we sent another test, and it uh, still, the confirmatory test came back positive in, in Christmas Eve of 19, December 1986. And this was positive for? For the AIDS virus. At the time, Dr. Aoun was chief resident at Baltimore's Johns Hopkins Hospital. I um, had not been transfused, never had any major surgical procedure where I could have become, in con I could have required transfusion. And, uh, and so there was uh, absolutely no risk factor. You were not an IV drug abuser? Certainly not. You... Not a homosexual, not a promiscuous person, and I had ne never gotten transfused, and had never gotten any other type of blood products. So you were convinced that you got AIDS? From that patient, the leukemia patient in 1983. Dr. Aoun recalled that three years earlier, he had cut himself after drawing blood from a teenage patient sick with leukemia. It happened on the doctor's day off. The teenager had started to bleed extensively. Dr. Aoun remained at his bedside. I placed the blood of the patient in a capillary tube, small thin crystal tube, and went to seal the tube before putting in a special machine, in a centrifuge. In, when I was in the process of sealing the tube, um, the tube broke and went through my index finger and uh, what, was it a, cut my finger. Or was it a big cut? It was a small cut, but enough to make me bleed and enough to, for the tube to go inside of the skin. When he was cut in 1983, Dr. Aoun immediately had himself tested for hepatitis because at the time, the AIDS virus had not been identified and there was no reason to believe the young patient would have the disease. I'm fairly clear about the prognosis of this disease so far. I, uh, there is no cure. How do I feel about that? Very bad. I have a wife and a daughter and uh, a lot of other family that I'm very close to. Lots of dreams and lots of plans. How do I feel? Officials at Johns Hopkins, where Dr. Ayun practiced for six years, at first denied the 1983 patient he had treated carried the AIDS virus. Today, Johns Hopkins no longer challenges his account. The terrible ordeal now confronting Dr. Ayun is precisely the danger that worries other doctors, especially surgeons. Frequently, uh, you get stuck. I've had uh, knives uh, fall off the operative field, stick in my foot. 
Dr. Ronald Abel is a cardiovascular surgeon in New Jersey, one of several surgeons who told Nightline they would not operate on some people with AIDS. If I knew that somebody were, uh, were positive, I think that they best not go on the uh, heart-lung machine. And you would not want to operate on I would not want to operate on that patient, no. Have you had occasion to turn down such an operation? Yes, I have. Uh, Refusal to treat a patient. The American Medical Association ruled recently that's against medical ethics. But as one doctor asked, are we really kamikaze pilots? Dr. Abel performs heart bypass surgery in Newark. He spoke with Nightline before New Jersey's Board of Medical Examiners ruled that state doctors could lose their license if they refused to treat AIDS patients. Dr. Abel has been asked to operate on IV drug users who had AIDS and needed complicated open heart surgery. I've been referred to four such patients over the past year and a half, and I've refused to operate on them. From their viewpoint, from their medical viewpoint, uh, it's hopeless. Uh, and in a hopeless situation, too. Uh, furthermore, then add to that the risk of, of 20 or 30 uh, dedicated professionals who, again, have to wake up the next day and, and provide services to other patients, I think is wrong. I think it's morally wrong. Dr. Lorraine Day, Chief of Orthopedic Surgery at San Francisco General Hospital, believes that to minimize the risk to physicians, all hospital patients should be tested for AIDS. I operated yesterday. I had to scrub out several times to have my neck washed because blood spattered on my neck, to have my legs washed because blood spattered on my legs, to have my arms washed, to take all of my gowns off and all of my gloves off. And, and if you do that during every single procedure, you have to know the patients who are at high risk, low risk, and the patients who are positive and negative. Hospital officials were so bothered by Dr. Day's call for testing, they refused to let her talk to Nightline inside the hospital. Dr. Molly Cook, who also works at San Francisco General, opposes mandatory testing. She believes, like most doctors and the hospital's administrators, that AIDS patients must be cared for. The risk of my acquiring AIDS is not so great that uh, I can see uh, it justifying my refusing to take care of patients. I consider the risk to be within the line of duty. Even Dr. Aoun, who got AIDS from a patient, believes all physicians must treat people with the disease. Meanwhile, he is also waging a legal battle against Johns Hopkins Hospital. He sued them for $24 million because, he says, Hospital officials treated him like a leper when they learned he had AIDS. The hospital he charges spread rumors that he'd gotten AIDS from homosexual activities or IV drugs. Johns Hopkins denies the charges. Dr. Aoun hopes he'll be alive when the trial begins in January. Can you imagine going through this? Can you imagine having a family and going through this? Can you imagine seeing your daughter every day and not wanting to cry because you're not going to see her grow? Can you imagine all the dreams, you know, all the plans, all the plans with your wife, all the plans about your profession, about the people that you were going to contribute to, just shatter. Okay. This is James Walker for Nightline in Baltimore. When we come back, we'll hear opposing views on how much risk physicians should be expected to take as we talk with Dr. Ronald Abel, a heart surgeon, and Dr. Stephen Kayaza, a specialist in internal medicine. This is a plan to... The question is not whether doctors should treat AIDS patients, but how much risk they should be expected to take. Dr. Ronald Abel is a New Jersey heart surgeon who, as we've just heard, believes there's a place where the line should be drawn. He's with us in our New York studios. Also in New York, Dr. Stephen Kayaza, an internist in the New York area whose practice is to a large extent with people who are suffering from AIDS. Dr. Abel, where do you draw the line? Well, in terms of the patients I referred to on that tape, certainly a patient who is hopelessly ill with clinical AIDS, who is uh, very sick with infectious diseases, and who has also developed infections inside of his heart, rotting away the heart valves, uh, a condition called endocarditis, which ordinarily might be treated with emergency surgery in a desperate attempt to prolong somebody's life. Under those circumstances, since the chance of ultimate survival is so small uh, to begin with, when combined with uh, immune suppression, such as seen in AIDS, the results of surgery would probably be futile 
All right. Now, are those the only cases which you refuse? Those are the only cases that I uh, have known about. The problem, of course... What do you mean the only case you've known about? I, I want to know what cases you've turned down and, and what the criterion is. I have turned down uh, four cases of patients who were intravenous drug abusers uh, from this area who also had AIDS virus who developed endocarditis and I refused to operate on those. Now, I have not been faced with an <coughs> ordinary patient who was uh, recommended to have elective heart surgery, such as coronary bypass surgery. So we don't know about that population since we can't test patients routinely yet. Well, what, what would be your policy in that circumstance that you just cited? My policy now is uh, I obey the laws of, of our state and of our region, namely that patients are not routinely tested for the AIDS virus, so we go into the operating room not knowing what we're dealing with, and I operate on any patient who I consider has a a clinical indication and a hope of, of survival. So the, uh, you're talking about situations where you, the only case you'd turn down would be one where you knew that the patient was hopelessly ill with AIDS and, and you would do so in that, in that circumstance? Yes, that's the only... And, and do you believe that those, that those patients need your treatment, need the surgery? Well, in the cases that, that I've referred to already, my clinical impression was that they were so hopelessly ill that the likelihood of survival was nil. But, with, but, but uh, what, what, why did the issue of the surgery come up at all then? Well, because, it was the, really well, well, because the cardiologist, the infectious disease uh, uh, person, would take the viewpoint that they're dying of something that, that might be fixed. Uh, why won't you try it? Right. Well, if you won't operate on such patients, who should? Well, I don't believe anybody should. I, the, uh, the mortality of endocarditis in an intravenous drug abuser is 80 or 90 percent, whether they have surgery or not. Added, adding AIDS to that, it's a hopeless situation. All right. Dr. Kayaza, can you give us some sense from your experience of how widespread this sort of thing is? How often doctors are turning down patients, refusing surgery or other treatment because of the fear of AIDS? It's becoming increasingly common, Britt, and uh, <clears throat> I point out that dentists are having the same problem. <clears throat> that is, uh, patients with AIDS, patients infected with the so-called AIDS virus, are finding it increasingly difficult sometimes to, to obtain even routine medical care. If you happen to be a pregnant woman, this becomes very significant. I, I, I gather you've got a little bit of a frog in your throat. I feel apologize. Free to, feel, for that. That's all right. Feel free to take a drink of water if you will. I want to turn to Dr. Abel for a moment if I can. Dr. Abel, when you were in medical school, did you not imagine that someday you might be called upon to treat a patient who had been stricken with a deadly epidemic? Yeah, I probably did. In fact, uh, when I was a child, I, I spent uh, a few memorable weeks in a polio ward in 1946 during the summer epidemic. And in fact, I probably went into medicine because of the compassion of the doctors and nurses who took care of me. And I always thought that that kind of compassion and dedication uh, was a mandatory part of my profession, and I still believe that. I think that it's more than just a fine line, however, uh, between dedication and compassion for the ill, as I have for patients with AIDS or, or any other disease, uh, and a very, very high-risk kind of uh, medical care, such as open-heart surgery, dialysis, uh, and, and other very uh, high blood contact uh, procedures. I think under those circumstances, the likelihood of a successful outcome in terms of helping the patient, prolonging his life, must be weighed against a very, very high risk of contagion. Now, you speak of this high risk of contagion. How many doctors uh, in this country, or in the world for that matter, have contracted AIDS as a result of performing surgery? Well, nobody knows. You well, found... do we know of a single documented case? Well, you, well, you, just, that way? you just showed one tonight. Well, now, he, he contracted AIDS not as a result of performing surgery, which is what you're talking about here. He contracted it through a, through a, uh, a medical test in which, he, which a tube yeah. broke. What I'm talking about is what you do, which is surgery. How many, how many cases do we know of? I'm not personally aware of any, but right. I'm sure they exist. I'm sure that they will come out of the closet and uh, the results uh, will become apparent to the CDC within a matter of months or years. Britt, if I may comment on that, uh, healthcare workers. Dr. Kyle, let me. Let, I'm going to have to take a break here. Mm. Give you a chance to take a sip of water, and uh, we'll continue our discussion in a moment. On 20. 
With us again from New York are Dr. Ronald Abel and Dr. Stephen Kayaza. Dr. Kayaza, I really didn't give you a very good crack at Dr. Abel's argument. He, he asked really the question of what is to be gained uh, by treating these patients who's, for whom there really is no cure at what could be considerable risk, uh, not only to the surgeon, but to others in the operating room. Clearly, if a patient is terminally ill, uh, I would agree with him. However, number one, I dispute the fact or the statement that there necessarily is no cure for AIDS. We're getting closer and closer all the time. I myself am having remarkably good luck these days. Secondly, I'd like to point out that since Hippocrates, uh, catching a disease <clears throat> from a patient has been an occupational risk hazard that doctors, <clears throat> excuse me, have to put up with. Uh, I, I take it that what we're dealing with here is a case of, uh, of laryngitis, Doctor. Yeah, I apologize. That's perfectly all right. I, I, I'd like to carry that with you a step further. You said that you yourself were having remarkably good luck. I take it you mean by that with your patients. Correct, yes. You, you, are, you are not yourself uh, uh, suffering from the, uh, from the disease. No, I'm not. I, I realize that sounds like a peculiar question to you. I just didn't want our audience to be misled by the fact that your voice is a little hoarse and, uh, and you seem a, you I seem a little that. bit uh, no. under the weather. I, didn't, I wanted to clear up that point if mm -hmm. I could. Um, do you do surgery? No, I'm, I don't. I'm an internist. So that does put you a little bit in the position of uh, urging the uh, course of action that you yourself are not going to have to take, doesn't it? Uh, that's correct, but we all have, <clears throat> excuse me, accidental needle punctures. We all have accidents. All cases of infection of healthcare workers by the so-called AIDS virus can be traced to fault in technique. If we follow proper technique and proper guidelines, <clears throat> Excuse me, healthcare workers are at no greater risk than the general population. Dr. Abel, what do you think about that? Uh, it, can you not take safeguards that will prevent uh, this virus from spreading in the operating room? Well, sure you can, but uh, uh, on occasion accidents happen. And uh, again, since there is no national policy authorizing routine testing for the HIV agent, uh, the argument that we should be careful all the time, which has been waged, is specious. It's like uh, going 55 miles an hour uh, on the freeway. You, you, you'll do it when you're behind a, a, a state trooper, but when he's not around, you probably won't be that careful. Okay. I have a few other comments about what was said, however. As far as Hippocrates is concerned, uh, he never had to deal with AIDS. And I have a feeling that the so-called oath, at which I took, and... Uh, and my colleague from Manhattan took, uh, would have been written somewhat differently had there been a highly contagious disease which was uniformly fatal without uh, adequate treatment. I think that Hippocrates might not have suggested that we need lay our lives on the line to save the life of another human being, one for one, or the uh, life of my wife. Uh, she shouldn't die because I treat an IV drug abuser. I think that's wrong. Uh, just the contrary, in fact, is the case in Hippocrates' time because it was a pre-modern, pre-antibiotic period. We had, in fact, much worse diseases. I feel that if the doctor cannot honor the oath he took when he graduated medical school, he belongs in another field. Well, Dr. Abel? Well, I, I think that the attitude of uh, many internists, as expressed tonight, and reflect the courage of the non-combatant. Uh, he doesn't have his hands uh, in a sea of blood, dealing with sharp objects, uh, 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 with the uh, chance of a gross contamination. You saw what happened to the young, unfortunate doctor from Baltimore who cut himself in a capillary tube. Uh, I deal with uh, thousands of times the potential virus particles uh, and, uh, that he did every day. Dr. Abel, when you get right down to it, though, isn't what you're saying simply that you don't want to do, in some instances, what doctors do because you might get sick and die? Uh, in many ways, that's what I'm saying. I will reluctantly uh, admit to that, yes. All right. I want to raise with you, and we'll, we'll, t we'll discuss it uh, at, at greater length when we come back, this question of how medical professionals, doctors and others, know when they're dealing with AIDS patients. Regardless of the question of whether you treat them or not, there is, a, there is this outstanding question of whether doctors and other professionals ought to know, and we'll discuss that when we continue in a moment. Conversation with Drs. Ronald Abel and Stephen Kayaza. Dr. Kayaza, there's one thing I think we learned from the setup piece this evening, and it is that hospital uh, operating rooms, and indeed hospitals in general, are kind of bloody places. 
Under, and, and given the risk of contagion that we saw illustrated in the tragic case of uh, Dr. Aoun, would it not be only fair for doctors and other healthcare professionals to be able to know when they go in to treat a patient whether or not that patient has the uh, AIDS virus? I don't see how that would really change anything. I don't see how that would change surgical technique. Sur proper surgical technique is proper surgical technique. And if it is observed, then no one's going to be infected with anything. But I've talked to a number of doctors, all of whom say that one way or another in orthopedic surgery and other kinds of surgery, inevitably, accidental things happen. Special precautions can be exercised, but not maintained at a high level at all times, as Dr. Abel suggested. Isn't it really a reasonable thing to ask for testing? And if it's, and even if you think it's not, I mean, if you don't think it's, it's going to do any good, are there not other reasons that you oppose it? That's really what I'm trying to get at. I'm, I oppose it because, uh, for the reasons that it's being done, I oppose it because I feel it's going to create a whole generation of second-class citizens to whom we will deny medical care. That's immoral, that's unethical, and it's also clearly illegal. Dr. Abel, what is your view on that point? Well, there's always a conflict uh, between the individual care of a patient and what's right for society. I think that we have a major problem controlling this epidemic. It's been called uh, by Dr. Bowen the major health, uh, public health issue we're facing. Uh, and by not testing the hospitalized patient, we're not able to control that very population. The Surgeon General gets on television and tells normal heterosexual kids to use condoms if they can't be sexually abstinent, and yet we're told that we can't test our patients. A few days ago, I admitted an IV drug abuser who was out of it and, and fell down and bled into his chest, was obviously at high risk for AIDS. I couldn't take his blood for a test unless he gave me his permission. I understand. Dr. Abel, thank you. Dr. Kaiser, thank you as well. I'll have to make that the last word. Thank you both. That's our report for tonight. I'm Britt Hume in Washington. For all of us here at ABC News, good night.